we have the Mount Everest of speaking challenges. We stand between you and drinks. We stand between you and dinner. We are at the end of a long day. Um, and I have to just, <clears throat> so, you know, we had three panels for this session. One was technology, one was policy, and we're the workforce panel. Okay, the other panels didn't stay in their lanes, and they were all talking about workforce. So I'm just saying that, you know, like they're all up there trying to work. I'm like, wait a minute, that's our panel. So I just think that that tells you how important workforce is um, and how important the issues are when we think about clean energy and workforce are. So if you will please give the um, panel your attention. So what we decided to do, because we knew we were at the end of the day, is we're gonna keep this pretty lively, pretty quick, um, we're going to ask you guys to chime in with questions, so be ready for those. I've asked each of the panels, we're going to go in the order that they're in your program. We're going to ask each of them to just give you a quick couple minutes on who they are so that you know their perspective and how they are viewing the workforce and workforce issues. And then I've asked them each to talk about what scares them about the workforce and what excites them about the workforce. And then lastly, I've asked them to tell you what they think, if they were to give you one action item that you could all do, what that would be at the end. So that's what we're gonna do in this next quick round. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, I think, Sarah, you're first, right? I am now. <laughs> Are you? Wait, 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 is that right? Are you yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. I know who's first, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Sarah Gerdowski, I am the Executive Director of the Global Energy Management Center at SKU Denver, um, also newly merged from the J.P. Morgan Center for Commodities. So, um, fantastic to be in education. I love talking workforce, so I could not be more excited to hear all the panels talk workforce. Um, and a couple things you should know about me and how I kind of approach energy and how I approach workforce. Um, one is from a business perspective. I found being, I still consider myself young, a young woman in energy and in academics, the more you can talk business in the bottom line, the more people can pay attention to make impact. So I always approach workforce from that kind of business perspective. And then the people perspective. Um, I went to school um, hoping to be working in the international development world, did that for a little bit. And so people have always been top of mind for me. So I'm always gonna think about that human perspective. We all see, you know, World Energy Council, she always talks about like the people perspective and humanizing energy in those pieces. I very much think of that because the people I work with in day in, day out at the education level, are people right they're the ones who all want to hire they are the ones who um we want to keep and retain and so i hear their stories their personal stories their accounts who they are and why they're there and so i always approach um everything i do even talking about business understanding that there's this human element to it and how i can support it so that's a big piece of how i approach workforce the other two things you know about me is i we've heard people say not eternal optimist but stubborn optimist things like that i am very much that i'm a glass half full all day Type of gal. So no matter what challenge you give to me, we can conquer it. We can get through it together. Um, the other part is that um, I'm a collaborator. So I'm not an engineer by training, like a lot of you are, which is fantastic. But I know some phenomenal people. So my goal and my purpose in life and how I'm going to approach workforce and all the energy challenges is that I know someone that you should know. Right? I want to connect you to the right person so we can solve these challenges together because. I've seen some innovation. I, I do a half mile man It's fantastic, right? That what is happening out there, there's probably somebody who just needs to make that connection. And because I'm in education, I'm a safe place as I am with the therapy for, for um, <laughs> folks. So I worked with oil and gas, I work with renewables, I work with government, I work with policy. If people could just have my perspective all the time, we probably solved everything. <laughs> <laughs> we just had to make those connections. And so that's that's my goal. That's my goal in life, that's my goal in my professional career, is to make those connections for folks because they don't even know that we already know the answers to this. And so diversity of thought is really important for me. And so I'm an advocate for um, women in energy, but most important, diversity of thought and diversity of fuel source and people, right? So how, how we can do that. So that's kind of my platform, and that's how I'm going to approach everything we talked about today. Um, and incredibly excited to be here in this group of women. I started my education career. I went to all women's college by accident, and I didn't realize how wonderful that was and how that set me up. So, you know, I'm just really empowered by all the women in the room, all the awardees, like, fantastic um because we want to do more in my life so thank you um that's why we need to be together as often as we can so that's me so i'll answer the other questions later right perfect yeah 
Well, thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Maria, for your leadership. You're a rock star. And thank you to our sponsors. It's just my two seconds to say thank you to all of you. We're really appreciative. Um, I'm Deb Froel. I currently serve on two corporate clean energy boards, XL Fleet and ITC Holding Corporation, up until June. I was on two other boards, Renewable Energy Group, which um, was acquired by Chevron, helping them through their energy transition. And then we also took... Uh, I owned new scale power technologies, the first module, small modular nuclear technology. Um, we appealed that in May of this year. So some really exciting things um, to scale and grow the energy transition uh, through the board work. Before my board work, I spent almost 30 years at GE. And in my last role at GE, I led um, the Global Clean Energy Innovation and Sustainability Strategy for the company, it was called Eco-Imagination, um, where we invested $25 billion in clean energy innovation, and that returned $300 billion in revenue for the company, and we reduced the footprint of greenhouse gas emissions by 48% um, in the company. The, I always like to say those numbers because corporations and the ability to scale is quite phenomenal. And so we'll talk about that more and what excites us and what worries us is just, you know, some of these policy tailwinds are really phenomenal and will be game changers. Um, I also serve on a couple of clean energy advisory boards with NREL, with University of Minnesota, and I've been an ambassador now for, um, since 2014. It is a badge I wear very proudly and, and it's a community that is tremendous. And so um, I approach workforce being in corporate America, my, my corporate jobs, now my board jobs. I'm on a mission um, to make sure that there is diversity around the table. The data is there, the proof is there, better performance, better profits. Um, there is no question. We have better discussions, we solve better problems. Um, throughout my whole corporate career, Every team I led when I left, that team was more diverse than when it started. And um, the same thing, I'm on a mission in corporate boards as well. Um, my first two corporate boards um, that I joined, I was the first woman on the board. I looked around the room, I'm like, oh my God. This was like 30 years ago. I gotta do something. That's why, change maker, yes. And I made a fast bolt to uh, the Donald Gov Committee, where I knew I could influence and advocate. That's the committee on boards that does succession planning for CEOs and, and board members. And, and um, I'm happy to say, yes, I was the first woman, but in a matter of a short time, I had 40% diversity on one board and 33% on another board. Um, and so we can do it. It takes courage and grit sometimes to drive the change, but it's worth it. It's the right decision as we go through um, the transition um, from an executive perspective. And I'm super excited about this discussion today and look forward to your questions as well. Yeah. Cool, I think that was next. Um, so Deb Ryan, um, I've got to admit, I feel a little bit like imposter in the room. Like when I talk to young people, like imposter syndrome is real. Um, I'm quite new to what I would call clean energy. I'm actually a petroleum engineer. Um, and I spent 16 years in upstream oil and gas, um, obviously in Australia and, and then in the US. Um, and 18 months ago, I switched and I now work at S&P Global Commodity Insights. And I head up our low carbon commodities work that we do from Adelaide's point of view. Um, and I got put in my role because as we look at emissions and the other side of it, the company wanted someone who understood the operations and could actually have that conversation and, and understand that. And so as I look to workforce, um, I wear a number of different hats, both within S&P and in other places. Um, so within S&P, obviously, I lead a team that's global um, and, and very diverse and, and doing all sorts of different things, which is super fun. Um, I'm also part of the um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Advisory Council within S&P as well. Um, I'm actually doing a panel on that tomorrow morning, which I'm really excited about. Um, but that's, you know, for internal purposes. So this is a conversation. I'm, I'm very honored to be here, actually, again, as, as someone that's sort of new to the more clean energy space. Um, outside of S&P, um, I actually teach um, for Sarah. Um, I teach a carbon class um, at CU Denver. Um, so from a workforce education point of view, um, education is something I'm exceptionally passionate about, um, both for myself and for others, and I'm, I'm super excited to 
be part of that next sort of step in terms of education. And then I served on a number of um, association nonprofits. So I, I used to be the uh, treasurer for the Women's Energy Network Foundation. Um, as part of that work, we were doing um, mid-career grants for women um, in the energy space, again, across all forms of energy, looking at how we help women at that mid-career level when they need, you know, maybe a certificate or a class that they need to do or something like that, that maybe their companies weren't in a position to fund or couldn't fund um, and stuff like that. So it was something, you know, it was very exciting to get off the ground um, with that organization. And I also serve... Um, on the Society of Petroleum Engineering's International Board of Directors. So I'm one of the North American Regional Directors. So as part of that um, sort of twofold piece of that is that one, I'm constantly talking to students, obviously, um, talking to the young petroleum engineers coming through the pipeline, um, a number of who are at Texas A&M and Stanford and some of the other schools that support the C3E program, obviously. Um, and, you know, what their questions are about, you know, the future of oil and gas and the future of energy and what does that look like, um, and particularly for young women. Um, but as part of the SPE as well, the SPE has also been very focused on obviously sustainability and through the diet program, starting to bring sustainability into operations from an oil and gas perspective. And what does that look like both here in the US and globally? And so I approach workforce from a number of different perspectives um, and yeah, very excited about bringing that to today's conversation. So yeah, happy to be here. Okay. So I get to that clean up here. No, it's, it's tough to go after such an amazing group, but I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to try not to turn my back against the entire uh, room, but you know, I, it's funny when I was listening to everyone talk, I, um, I, I was wondering where I should start and, and really um, talk about exactly what I do. So I'll talk a little bit exactly what I do and then I'll tell you my why. Um, because I actually think that's a really important piece of everyone should really understand why they do this, because that is that is not only a way to keep you centered and keep you working hard and keep you you know healthy uh, as we all do this hard work, but it also creates a culture within the clean tech movement that you know people want to be part of. Um, so I'm at the Department of Energy. I joined um, almost two years ago, which is wild to think about. And I lead the workforce and equitable access team in the Solar Energy Technologies Office. So workforce is in my title. So I obviously um, spend a lot of my time thinking about how to address this big challenge. Um, but, you know, if you take a couple steps back, I, uh, I was both an artist and a Girl Scout. And so I had this love, love of the environment steward of um, nature and really wanted to get into a field where um, I was protecting the climate. And, and so that was really sort of my driver coming in um, into school. Um, I actually went to art school. Uh, so, you know, I, I find myself in sort of a, a funny place now being at the Department of Energy. Um, but I think actually uh, going to school for art really creates an opportunity to just be creative on how you approach problems um, and how you kind of, uh, you know, sort of work together and figure out solutions. And so it really wasn't until I was deeper into my career and I was the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Grid Alternatives Mid-Atlantic. For those of you who are not familiar with Grid, Grid is a nonprofit solar installer. It's actually an international organization. And I ran the Mid-Atlantic affiliate office. I stood that up and ran it for about six years. And we also developed the flagship workforce program while I was the executive director. And while I was there, we, so we were located in, um, uh, in a community that we served. And so GRID provides solar at no cost to low income households. And we also have a job training model to ensure that folks in that same community have an opportunity to join the clean energy transition. Um, and so one day we were all at the office and, um, and there was an incredible amount of police activity and helicopter activity going on. And so my everybody who was in the office runs, runs up the stairs and runs past my office out onto the rooftop. So I obviously get up and follow them. Um, and we see a number of police officers have, have an individual face down in the parking lot next door to the, the, um, our office. And we realize that it's actually one of my staff. And we start screaming, you know, at everyone like, he's with us, he's with us. Um, and, you know, they're not paying any attention to us. Um, so I run down onto the street and, you know, do what I can to help facilitate, you know, that, um, that, that situation. And they eventually do let him go, but it did take some time. 
And, um, and, you know, meanwhile, my staff is stressing out and they're all screaming and people are kind of all over the place. Um, so we all come back inside, things die down um, and we're debriefing. And mind you, you know, I was running an organization that was majority minority organization, very, very representative of the communities that we serve. Um, and, you know, we were just sort of taking a breather and, and, and talking about what just happened. And at one point I just said, I'm so sorry that happened. Like, I'm just so sorry. Like that, that is unacceptable in the workplace. You know, I really, you know, um, don't ever want to see that again. And the individual just looked at me and said, you know, I love you, Nicole. Um, but it wasn't the first time and it won't be the last. And at that moment, you know, my, my why shifted and my why was really about people and centering people in this conversation and ensuring that all Americans, all people have an opportunity to be part of this clean energy transition. And um, whether it's seeing the benefits of that deployment or, or being able to join um, the clean energy transition themselves and have a career in this and really see themselves in this transition and really feel like they belong. And so it really became my mission after that moment to center people. And that includes women, it includes everyone that has been historically excluded um, from our, you know, sort of traditional norms of things. And, uh, and there's a lot of intentionality that we can take to be successful in that place. So I'll leave it there um, and let us jump into the conversation. Great, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. So now we promised the group we're gonna be quick and light and interactive. And so now you all have a sense. We have an educator, we've got someone who's worked in corporate America. We have um, someone who's not only a petroleum engineer, but is also educating folks. And you have someone who's really deploying solar. Nicole also left out that she's in charge of the National Community Solar Partnership for the US Department of Energy, which is just a huge role that she plays for us at DOE. So, okay, so now we're gonna talk about, so I think, you know, hearing today, everyone keeps saying the time's now, it's urgent. And, and also people are a little nervous about workforce. So I want to ask each of the panelists if you'll just go through quickly, whatever order you want, you can decide we're going to kind of popcorn. Just what scares you? Like, what are the issues with workforce? Like, we all know we need to do it, and we know we need to hire a diverse workforce, but what scares you with that challenge facing us, given the urgency? Oh, okay. Um, so what, you know, really scares me of being in the solar industry specifically is that we need to hire over 750,000 new workers in the next eight years, basically, to meet our clean energy goals. Also with the goal layered on top of ensuring that those folks have uh, a pathway or an opportunity to join a union. And so, you know, like we can talk about intentionality, but it, the, the, um, the need is today and it's, incredibly massive and um and i think we do have to be intentional so i'm nervous that you know it's it's speed over intentionality and how do we balance those two so and, I, and i'll jump in on this um you just say nervous and that's kind of what brings up me so i you know they say you know excitement and anxiety are both the same emotion right it's just how you approach it with your mindset so i again that's not full i'm gonna say i'm excited but it's scared, but a little excited <laughs> that um, we need that many people, right? We need that many people, and that's just solar, right? That's just solar. Um, but what I'm scared about is that I feel like in energy, lots of times we have these separate conversations, right? And so we have these separate conversations with clean energy, some have to be including this, some have to be done. Um, you know, some, you know, and then we talk about oil and gas and fossils and the separate, and then they need more for us too. Um, and so I said to these students coming through, average age 34, which is a workforce, right, that those leaders that we need, and we're not, and they're saying, I want to be an energy professional and make this transition, right? That prime example, right? That's something we need to do. Um, you know, I need to teach. But also, the, the fact is, we don't have pathways for these people. So I'm scared we're going to miss the opportunity to meet this deadline that's so urgent for us to meet because we are not reaching across the aisle and because we are not including 
pathways and creating these pathways for folks to make those transitions. You have phenomenal engineers, phenomenal technical folks who have worked in highly regulated spaces and they want to, they're, they're curious, they're keen but curious, right? As to how, how they can move into this space, but there's no clear pathway for them. And there's also, when I sit with them individually and have these conversations, they're saying they don't want it. They won't even look at my application. I'm not even applying. Are you kidding me? You know, like we need everyone to make this transition and to make it quickly. So that is something I'm scared that we're going to miss this opportunity, this window to welcome this entire new group of people into the fold to get us to where we need to be because we're so focused on, oh, I want someone who's been in clean tech 30 years. Huh, okay. They're probably all just right here in the front right now. <laughs> And so we, we need to be broader and more inclusive, including from other sectors. And oil and gas is just an example because it's easy to pull out. There's many other sectors like that where we need to be more inclusive and in bringing those in. So I'm, I'm, again, that's why I say I'm, I'm excited, you know, but also anxious about the fact that we're still having very separate conversations while trying to solve the same problem. Right, workforce. And so, I'm going to work on that because I'm going to, you know, as I go over with my SBE hat and go and talk to students at Colorado School of Mines and Texas A&M and Texas Tech and all these amazing students that are going into engineering, right? I don't care if you're doing petroleum engineering or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering as an engineer. Like, I had chemical engineering as my undergrad and we're problem solvers, right? Like, half the organists today were engineers, right? At the core, there's huge problems to solve. and. The, the petroleum engineers that I talk to are so scared that, to Sarah's point, they're going to get overlooked because they've got that dirty word on their resume. And that is <laughs> terrifying to me, right? And so, like, and as I go and talk to them, they're all super excited about how I pivoted. I've even got my peers coming and asking me how I pivoted. I was like, I don't know, the right place, right time. Like, what's this? I don't know, it's weird. Um, but, like, that conversation of, you know, with, um, my TV made the comment about we're getting women in the door for STEM. That's something that I'm super passionate about. But we, we're at a risk of losing just technical people generally because we're not crossing over the barriers, right? Like, CCUS is a great example of an oil and gas technology that hydrogen is going to need and that the industrial sector is going to need to decarbonize and things like that. And so how are we looking at that? And then as I flip to my corporate pace, I've only been at S&P for 18 months, and I've got a team of engineers, geologists, chemical engineers looking at all these problems. I'm replacing my team for the second time because as soon as someone's got six months' experience, they're out the door somewhere else because to Sarah's point, they're there's so many of us. Suddenly, I've got 18 months experience in carbon and I'm an expert. That's terrifying. <laughs> and, you know, to be honest, right? Like, um, I'm chairing a conference in Barcelona next month. I'm like, how did that happen? Um, but, like, it's happening with our younger generation as well. You know, I built this phenomenal team that could look at all these problems and understand how, you know, refineries work and oil and gas operations work and stuff like that. And they've all gone somewhere else, whether it's back to, the, back to an oil and gas company, to a bank. Um, you know, back to engineering design, but now with this this phenomenal step on their resume, and it's that piece scares me from a corporate point of view because we are getting. And I had it was a mixed team, it was a global team, and they're all gone, and I'm starting again, and it's like, oh, like it's so hard. And that's you know, it's so yeah, from both like getting people in, but keeping them at the moment, there is fierce competition out there, and that's. Great if you're in that space already. Um, but yeah, it's it's keeping that pipeline. Let me just build on that, the retention side of things. My first comment though, like it's just an incredible opportunity in the clean energy space. It's still an emerging sector, and we can make this look like society. Like we have such a strategic opportunity to really be thoughtful about all of this. But um, you think about just the vast amounts of people that we need in a short period of time. It is, it's incredible. On the retention side, let's just take a step back just on the corporate world and like the decision makers and what's happening in the corporate world. I don't know if many of you saw, but recently um, the McKinsey uh, Lean In or annual survey came out. They surveyed 300 companies, 12 million people. And it's terrifying. I mean, women are quitting um, their leadership roles faster than ever. And the data, you know, basically says a woman that gets to the director level and then gets promoted, two women are leaving. And so, you know, women are still just as ambitious as men. But I think COVID has exasperated what the data is saying. COVID is really exasperated 
exacerbated the issue, whether it's affordable childcare, pay gap, flexibility, um, just opportunity in general. And so there's some real challenges about retention and having that diversity at the higher levels of these corporations to make decisions and, and continue to diversify their own teams. And um, I just think that there's um, you know, just a real, real crisis that we have to be looking at. And in the summary, you know, um, they say women aren't leaving work, they're leaving companies, and oftentimes it's managers. And so that to me says culture, right? We have cultural issues and we need cultures of inclusion, and that means listening um, to those voices, listening hard, and being uncomfortable with what you're hearing, but a bias for action because we need to retain and attract, you know, that next generation. Same thing at the board level, so corporate and then the board level. So progress is being made, um, but we have a little bit of a steep up this year. So 28% of board seats are now um, filled by women on the Russell 3000. That's up 10% since 2008. Women of color have 6% of those board seats, but in the last six months, we've lost about 8%. And the data says, you know, back to COVID hangover, still a bit, and then, um, you know, the economy is challenging. That means we won't be gender balanced until at least another decade at the top of the companies. Like, that, that's concerning. Like, we have to drive change. We have to, those of us that serve on boards or in the executive race, we've got to continue to advocate and drive change and, and decision-making where, where, where we can. So when we were prepping for this panel, they also could come, please ask us the scare question first because we've got to leave on a happy note. So like we've all just really brought this whole room just down. Or shit, or there's not enough people. And okay, so now we're gonna pivot and we're gonna talk about what's exciting and what this group of experts is excited about in the workforce arena. And then we're gonna turn over to you guys for your questions. So who's excited about what? Because you now we need to be excited about workforce because the time is now on a surgeon and we're, we're going to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. So three things. Progress, people, policy. That's what I'm really excited about right now in the workforce front. So I always think about results and outcomes. We are making progress. You heard it today from panelists. 40% of our energy mix is carbon free. We're reducing emissions by 36% against the 2005 baseline. Bringing electric vehicles on the road today. The other thing that I just want to mention the ESG movement is really helping and giving tailwinds to the intersection of clean energy and corporate America. Um, you are seeing companies make big pledges and commitments to decarbonize, adopt renewable energy in their companies, require their supply chains. These are discussions in the boardroom at the ex and executive conference being tied to. That movement is helping us, and it's just amazing progress to see. People, we have 3 million people in the clean energy workforce today, and growing pipeline needs to continue. You've heard what the challenges are, but it is still... It is the fastest growing, most innovative sector um, in our economy today, and it is continued and positioned very well. And the policy, I think Sally said it best today, those of us that have been around for a while that didn't have policy, when we watched cap and trade go, we watched CPP pass by, we finally have national policy, and that is giving us the tailwinds to further investment, further innovation, further resources and scale, and I'm just excited about all of that. Great. Great. I can go next. I'm really, the thing I'm really excited about, like as as you look to again, my lens is still very oil and gas focused. But traditionally, when you look at oil and gas companies, the same between now would be an HR person and sustainability lead, right? <laughs> but the sustainability leads often a woman, right? And that, to be honest, that's really exciting. And I think what I've seen, you know, within my role, you know, myself, my counterpart on the pricey side, we're both female. The woman that heads up our hydrogen work, she's female. Um, we've got a lot of females coming through in a, again, s and still quite male-dominated, but in the, the like, energy transition space, it's very female-heavy, and that's really exciting. Um, I was at APEC in Singapore, um, I want to say last month, it was September, which is crazy, that was two months ago, and again, full of oil traders in, in Singapore and very male-heavy at the organisation, at the event, and we did a panel, and it was myself, my colleague, and another person, and it was an all-female panel talking about carbon and decarbonisation of oil trading and stuff like that, and 
it was so cool. And it was, you know, and it wasn't we were talking about it, it wasn't a big deal. We were there because we were supposed to be there and we knew what we were doing and what we were talking about. And that is progress as far as I'm concerned. And super exciting that that voice is coming from a very female dominant group. Um, you know, so that to me is really exciting when we look to um, how we build the workforce and, and what that looks like. And people that are putting their hands up um, as well for that future pace um, in terms of, of what it means to be a woman in corporate America right now. Um, because of you know ESG and sustainability goals and stuff like that. So so I'll jump in. Um, so, uh, you know, it's ex it's a, obviously an exciting time to be in clean energy, but um, it's also exciting to be at the government right now because we have incredible goals sort of setting the pathway to, you know, this new uh, re rebuilding the economy. And so I, I love that we're actually starting to get down to the brass tacks of how do we actually do this? How do we make a workforce look like the whole of America and the whole of the world. Um, and so one of the things that I keep hearing come up time and time again is the importance of wraparound services. And this typically comes up in conversations where, you know, we're talking about solar installers and working in frontline communities and making sure people feel fully supported um, as they enter into the workforce and they can be successful in their career. But I would say that it's actually broader than that and that the, the conversation of wraparound services is centering people in the conversation and, and really truly understanding what services people need to be fully centered in their career. And so, you know, like we talk a lot about you know, if you're, if you're hungry, you're going to not do very good at your job. If you, you're unhoused, you're going to struggle. If you don't have good transportation, you're clearly going to struggle. Um, but if you don't have childcare, you're going to struggle. Um, if you, you know, don't have people in your um, work group that look like you, you're going to struggle. If there aren't people willing to um, be mentors to you and help lift, someone you mentioned lift, um, you know, while you are, you know, working as hard as you possibly can in your day job, um, you're going to struggle. And so really having this wraparound service conversation and having it at the whole of government level has been really exciting. And so, you know, like, yes, we're talking about clean energy workforce, but we have to have that conversation with the Department of Labor, the Department of Education. We also have to include um, housing and urban development. We have to include the Department of Justice and, and, you know, Small Business Association and others. We're really talking about how do we ensure that we're fully centering the employee in this transition while it is, you know, driven by industry, but being super intentional and actually knowing how to do that and having the ability to have a whole of government approach to truly center the worker and be intentional and do all the things that we know that we need to do is incredibly exciting. And so that that's what I'm excited about. And so we're, we're just getting it done. So if you want to come to the government, we are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to train people. <laughs> I don't care if you have, don't have a clean energy background, we'll, we'll figure it out. So I just, we just, we just need passionate people that are willing to work hard. So. I love what you're saying, Nicole. I'm so glad you're there and the right person for that job. It seems like for sure. Um, I would say I'm excited about two things, and they're going to be non traditional. I'm excited about high gas prices, and I'm excited about uh, uh, strong labor right now. So, and I think those two things um, really kind of speak to why I think workforce is great right now because we have an opportunity to reset what it means for energy and for hiring, both expectations of how you treat your employees, um, how you run your business, right? Clean Tech has this huge opportunity to attract talent just on that because you are still a virgin industry, right? Right. So we have the opportunity to do it right, um, to attract and retain talent that way. I think uh, consumers now are driving the vote on a lot of things. So we think about gas prices are high, so they're thinking about their behaviors, they're thinking about what's going on in the world, how geopolitics affects them individually in their pocketbook. Um, Raises the profile of energy in general, what sources they're using. Um, and so now energy is becoming like a household conversation, right? And so now we're thinking about what other careers might be in energy. We're talking about energy all the time. So, you know, you've had those kitchen table conversations. So, having high guys, gas prices, it's good and bad, right? Um, people are affected in different ways, but they're affected. 
right? They are affected. We're, we're making impact, um, good or bad, and we're going to have those conversations more and more. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited that companies, um, we're not energy companies, have energy roles now. That's great. For labor, it's even better because now you have more competition ability to go to more and more places. But people are talking about it. Um, and so that's only going to drive more opportunity. It's going to drive um, more interest from folks. And it's it's ultimately going to help. The short term, I don't have a lot of solutions for you. Um, other than network, get to know people. Um, that's the biggest thing. Um, and then also, um, are we ready for challenges? Can I do my challenge? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things I brought up. Um, it's really important to me since I work across industry um, to see your oil and gas folks. And again, that average age is interested in, in different sectors. If you're a hiring manager, find someone in the oil and gas industry. Ask them these questions. Um, if you know somebody in the oil and gas industry, encourage them to apply. And then my ultimate challenge to you all would be, you can find me or maybe some of you are working on this. You can tell me you're working on this and we can work together on it. Is Let's create a map. Let's create that roadway and that pathway for folks who are not in clean tech on how they can transfer their skills. So if they're a mechanical engineer, if they're a civil engineer, and it doesn't make quite sense, but if they're a petroleum engineer, right, or if they're a division order analyst, if there's something, all these different levels, let's create these pathways. Let's make this a public document. Let's make this government. Let's give this to different corporations so they can better understand how they can plug somebody in, right? These are so many jobs we need to write. You know, an algorithm to like match these folks up. So let's create this pathway and we can actually do something practical and in a timely manner. Right? That, that piece we can actually do. There's smart women in the room, there's smart men in the room. We can figure this small piece out and at least give this to society or the world to make this happen. So that would be my challenge. Find me if you're working on it, tell me you're working on it. Um, and let's figure out how we can actually do that and make some impact on this workforce now. Awesome. Well, I am I'm being very mindful of time because I know I'm out never. So, um, <laughs> but we um, want to leave a couple uh, minutes for questions and answers. So we're going to make sure we have enough time for each of the three panels who haven't given you their challenge or your action item, your go home, your homework to do that. But let's open up the floor now to questions. Um, any questions, comments? Yeah, there's one over there. Should I use a microphone or can you hear me? I think we can just yell and I'll try to <laughs> Um, so I'm in New York City where we have a very diverse population, but not a very diverse workforce. And I think one of the problems we experience in the solar and storage industry is that the, the folks that are being targeted for training and all this stuff, they are ones that are put in positions of manual labor, going onto hot roofs, um, doing exhaustive, exhausting tasks. And they're also really underpaid. They're often subsidized by other co companies or um, foundations. How do we get past that so that if they're, they're the normal? New York City is so diverse that the solar industry in New York City is all white and all male. Very unfortunate. Yeah, okay, I'll jump in there. So <laughs> I, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot in that question and that I think one of the, the things that is incredibly important and that we need to be paying a lot of attention to is how do how do we create pathways, um, career pathways? And so you know you got to start somewhere. Um, so you you know you come in entry level, but you actually when you do come in at entry level, you know what that pathway is. And and there's in in shifting the conversation from just a, a single technology job to a craft has actually been one of the other major conversations that's really helping, you know, really create that sort of vision, that pathway to understand like, okay, so I start out as a pre-apprentice and then I go through apprenticeship and then I become a journeyman and then I'm a site supervisor. And so there's a true pathway through a craft trade. And, and so, you know, not focusing exclusively on the technology, I think is a really important way to, to, um, you know, make sure that people continue to move up. And then, you know, obviously it takes time. Like you gotta train people, but at time, you know, two years was gonna go like that. So when you're, you know, you're gonna be an apprentice, you're gonna be a journey person. Um, and so I think some of it is, is being really intentional around recruitment and making sure that, um, that there are barriers to actually entering into the crafts and the trades. And, um, you know, so we hear a lot of conversations around, um, you know, drug tests or drug, offenses or you know like if you have an offense on your um, record you, you can't enter into a craft and so i'm talking about the unions craft union trades um and you know i think unions 
rec fully recognize that. And we've been having that conversation for the past year. And what's really interesting is that now that labor is attached directly to um, IRA tax standards. And so folks are really having to move in sort of the, the union apprenticeship direction anyway, just to have to be able to access those tax credits that make um, deployment subsidized through tax credits. Um, and so again, that, that really taking the craft approach centers the employee um, in, in the conversation and really gives them power through union membership to, um, to fight for better wages, better benefits, um, better hours, you know, better jobs. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, it took me a little while to, to sort of like, oh, light bulb. Um, but, you know, I came from a nonprofit organization that did a job that had job training baked into its mission. And, um, and, and sort of taking that as sort of a pre-apprenticeship model and really understanding the value that unions can provide in this conversation. Um, I'm not saying that that transition is not going to be easy, but it, it's really uh, redirecting the conversation around decisions being made exclusively by the company you work for, but decisions being made by the people that work for that company. And so I think that's the big transition that we should be paying attention to. That's so cool. Let's have one more audience question, and then you guys are going to have like 30 seconds each to give an action. Okay, who's go? Yeah, go. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to Dr. Pollard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel. I work for the Southern Environmental Law Center. This isn't a law-based question at all, though. Um, I'm curious, in talking about transition, um, for people who are in careers, something particularly of like coal plant shutdown, lots of people work there, and then not all of those people are going to be able to work at like a solar facility or whatever is replacing that capacity. And not that they may necessarily do like that immediate shift, but I think about those people and like their ability to make a lateral move. So like, yes, they can be retrained. Yes, they can go into clean energy fields, but I don't think they, I'm, I'm curious if they have an opportunity to move laterally because I'm, I feel certain that many of those people have families and they have commitments and they built a life kind of based on the expectation of where their career would go. And I'm, uh, I, I think the pivot can be challenging from a like individual, real, what is my family going to do type way. And I'm curious how much of that conversation is part of the conversation around transition jobs and careers and like workforce development. Thank you. Yeah. 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 You want to start? I'm sorry. I mean, definitely want to technical side of it. Um, so in Colorado, can I speak to Colorado because that's where we are, you know, we have a just energy transition office as part of the government, which is huge. Um, they help look into some of that, um, try to figure out how, can we retrain, can we not retrain. Um, even the federal government, we haven't been talking about that. Um, it, it's, it's, a real, it's a real concern, it's a real issue. Because some of it is, do they want to retrain, do they want to stay in energy, do they not? And I think sometimes we're trying to solve a, a problem that that's, that's not what it is, maybe. They just would do a coal work and maybe they can do two weeks on, two weeks off in a coal plant someplace else, right? So they can travel. Like that's many of the travel schedules that are still set up for um, for energy, you know. So we're trying to solve and put them in cleaner energy jobs, but maybe we're still using that type of energy where their skill set is required and it is phasing out. And so maybe we don't tend to have as many people within those roles anymore, which is fine, but maybe we can still find ways for them to do the work that they feel proud of, that they've been trained in for so many years, right? So there, there's different ways to do it. And some of it is talking with those communities um, and really finding out what it is that they want and need to your point. Of, you know, they have a certain level of expectation where they would be and at certain income levels that they thought they would have, but maybe it's not retraining. Maybe it is taking the opportunity to look at uh, how we approach work now um, and finding ways for them to still be able to do that, but in different capacities, different schedules, things like that. But it's going into those communities and having those conversations, not us to say in here in a room how we're going to help these people transition, because that's not a solution, right? We know that from international development work, right? You don't go someplace and tell people how to fix their own problems. Like, that's not how you do it, right? You have them help you figure out what those, what those um, concerns are and how they're going to fix their own problems. So, I didn't really answer your question, so I'm going to let Nicole answer. Well, why don't you just like, jump in on something that Sarah said? And I think it's it's it builds on what she's saying is that, and as someone who's come from doing the gas industry, people are really proud of what they do. Like people are exceptionally proud of you know providing energy, whether it's clean or not, to the world, having a good paying job, that kind of stuff, and suddenly be told, and I've been through this, that what you do is not valuable. 
sucks. Like it really, really does. And so I think there has to be a certain level of humanity in this in terms of getting to the bottom of, you know, people might not want to transition because it's like, well, you're just telling me what I did for the past 30 years is useless. Like, so it has to be a conversation there that helps people feel like their skills are valuable so that they're proud to also do something else. So that's like, that's something I think that, and it's something we're facing in the oil and gas industry as well. Like I, I, when I go to Texas, when I do all that, you know, people are really proud of what they do and you can't take that for granted. So like, it's just, that's something that we need to consider. So. Yeah, and I, I'll actually jump really quick. Really, really <laughs> so, so um, I mean, I think five years ago, we were having a lot of conversations around like, hey, cold worker, you should be some solar installer. And like, that's kind of a, not a great idea. Like, it's really, again, about the craft transition. And so, you know, finding exactly what you're talking about is like, how are those skills, you know, transferable? And I think that's why sort of onshoring a lot of new domestic manufacturing is actually a really exciting opportunity for skilling up a workforce or transitioning a workforce because of so many of those skills are very lateral, are very transferable. And so we're thinking about that right now around, okay, well, maybe you don't want to be on a roof installing solar, um, but you know, you do have very transferable skills for manufacturing facilities. And so, you know, having those conversations, so I think it's something that's just starting because we're now just starting to talk about domestic manufacturing again. Okay, quick challenge. 30 seconds each. Just what's your challenge to this room on workforce issues? Deb, you go first. So you enjoyed today. This community is amazing. And my challenge to all of you is to support one another. This is hard stuff. And the, you, the answers are not always easy, but you have an amazing network today to leverage and rely upon. Trust me, I had the bat phone to some ambassadors that helped me through things. And that's what we're here for. And so just support each other. Um, that's the power of this community. I've got a couple of things, but I promise I'll still be quick. I don't really um, so I was in an oil and gas event a number of years ago with a young engineering mentor of mine, a male. And I said to him, I was like, you should come to one of the women in energy events. And he's like, why? I was like, look around the room. And he was like, you're the only woman here. I'm like, welcome to my daily life. <laughs> and so the men that are in your room, like I told you, I mean, bring your friends. Like, <laughs> it's so important for people to feel empathy with what that feels like. Because I've had conversations with people in oil and gas where like, well, Vicky Hall, CEO of Echo Box, you know, which solves this problem. Like, oh my God. It's just, so that's kind of one of my challenges. The other thing is starting to normalize behavior. It's one of the things I'm exceptionally proud that my company does, is that they offer six months paid parental leave. I all came up. Things and not just if you think you've adopted, if you for a whole host of other reasons, not just having your own maternal child, um, or paternal child. Um, and some of the senior men at the company have made a point of taking six months blocks to prove that that is okay. And that is real. I know not all companies can do that, but normalizing behaviors where it doesn't matter who's stepping out to do some of that takes the burden off the woman. Um, and then the last thing is the ability to bring your authentic self to work. And I know that's not just a, a, a workforce thing, but we've heard today from so many wonderful characters, right? Like, and the ability for us to do that and bring our identity and our work, our, ourselves to work and know that that's okay and our company's gonna celebrate it and not be like, but you don't, you're not wearing a suit and you've got purple hair and a nose ring and everyone's like, that's okay. Like that is, that's also part of it. So that's my, my three, so. All right, cool, uh, Yeah, so I think it's gonna actually follow on up to that. Is, you know, I ask everyone here in this room and I, I, I know I have some staff in the room too, so um, they know that what I'm about to say, but. I implore you to love your job. You are in a, you have an incredible moment in time right now where you're like, you're in charge. Like you go find the job that is the right job for you and love it, lean into it, bring in, and that'll be infectious. So if you're incredibly passionate about what you're doing, everybody around you will know that. And, and, and they will want to be part of this movement and bring you know, people along. I think one of the things that I hear time and time again is, is that, oh, I'm too young to be a mentor. No, you're never too young to be a mentor. Love your job, be a mentor. And so that is my, my challenge to everybody in the room. Love your job. Awesome. Thank you, panel. Thank you all for